disillusioned with the American political system, disillusionment with our government is a blessing. It is our awakening from the fiction that representative government is capable of representing us. Liberated from the clutches of illusion, our thought is set on a new path to establish new government where we really can establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and promote the blessings of liberty. Disillusionment is our blessing. There is an oft-repeated antidotal story in American folklore that outside Independence Hall in Philadelphia at the close of the Constitutional Convention on September 17, 1787, a woman, eagerly awaiting the results with the crowd that had gathered, shouted a question to Benjamin Franklin as he was leaving. Well, doctor, what have we got? A republic or a monarchy? Franklin's response to the woman was, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Franklin's alleged response, which suspiciously was not published until 1906, is peculiar. Mass democracy had been held in contempt ever since Plato's disparagement of it in his political philosophy. In this platonic view, the mass of ordinary people are too self-centered to be sufficiently interested in civic affairs and too ignorant and too much impelled by emotion to be entrusted with meaningful participation in government. The founders embraced this contempt for mass democracy by their choice of a strict republican form of government that limited direct citizen participation to voting for a single congressional representative once every two years. Nevertheless, the Franklin quote is almost always used to reprimand typical Americans by reminding us that our Republican bequest assumes the active and informed participation of its citizens. If American politicians do not represent the American people, but rather belong to a political caste with its own agenda, if the federal government has become a special interest group that looks out primarily for its own interests, if the government pays very little attention to what people think when it decides what to do, if people in government do not understand or really care about typical Americans, then it is because we as citizens have not lived up to our obligation. Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives, socialists and libertarians all buy into the essence of this argument in one form or another. They all agree that any failure of the American political system is ultimately the responsibility of typical Americans. But it isn't true. We typical Americans cannot be held responsible to keep a government we have not been empowered to keep. We typical Americans cannot be held responsible for any failure of the American political system because we have been disempowered from exercising any direct control. Whether or not we typical Americans are self-centered, ignorant, and impelled by emotional passion, whether or not we are deemed to have lived up to our civic obligation is irrelevant because, by design, we do not exercise any direct control over the American political system. The first three words of the Constitution emblazon we the people as sovereign, but in the absence of some of the basic democratic tools of popular control, such as recall, initiative, referendum, plebiscite, proportional representation, and fair ballot access, we the people is merely hyperbolic. 
Indeed, as author Ferdinand Lundberg has written, no matter how virtuous, intelligent, and informed a voter is, he usually has only a choice between two or at most three candidates for each office. And all of the candidates are of a certain type of mentality, no matter what party they belong to or what program they espouse. Candidates in abundance of each of the major parties have shown themselves time and time again to be utterly deceptive in what they promise as compared to what they deliver. Having disempowered typical Americans from exerting any direct influence in the political system, the founders entrusted the American government to an aristocracy of the rich and well-born. As if to imply that the mere possession of wealth alone was a magical transcendence above partisan passion, where reason, wisdom, and an uncommon benevolence compelled devotion to the common good. Despite that laudatory appraisal, the founders belied their trust in the rich and well-born by having acute concern that any faction among this august group might gain dominance of the political system and engage in tyrannous abuse. To prevent the concentration of political power, the founders divided power to such an extent that its centralized concentration was nearly impossible. In so doing, however, the founders solved one potential problem only by spawning two others. The first problem they spawned is the creation of a political system where laws are made for which no one in government can be held directly accountable. Thomas Paine's critique in 1776 of the British Constitution applies equally to our system of government in that it is so exceedingly complex that the nation may suffer for years together without being able to discover in which part the fault lies. Some will say in one and some in another, and every political physician will advise a different medicine. The deplorable lack of accountability referred to by Paine is, as Woodrow Wilson observed over a century later in his study of the American political system, an incentive for politicians to act irresponsibly. Nothing about the system is direct and simple. Authority is perplexingly subdivided and distributed, and irresponsibility has to be haunted down in out-of-the-way corners. The more power is divided, the more irresponsible it becomes. Law made in out-of-the-way corners led to the second problem. The founders unwittingly created a haven for self-serving special interests to nest and proliferate, where these groups can maneuver in secret to gain privileges, subsidies, and benefits from the government. With Congress fragmented among 47 committees, the crafting of most law is hidden from public scrutiny in private meetings or in subcommittee hearings that don't receive much, if any, attention in the mass media. In their extensive research on the topic, authors Clausen, Neustadtel, and Scott have exposed the real operation of the American political process. Without regard to party affiliation, the aim of the wealthy through the political action committees of their corporations is not to influence the members' public vote on the final piece of legislation, but rather to persuade a congressional member to accept and insert into the bill a carefully pre-designed loophole, intentionally incomprehensible in its legal jargon, that exempts their company from the bill's most costly or damaging provisions. In the highly unlikely event the exemption is publicly exposed, the member probably can back off and drop the issue with few consequences, and the corporation probably can go down the hall and try again with another member. This is how the laws are made for the benefit of business and the rich. In the end, the system lets members of Congress appear to be voting in the interest of typical Americans and for the common good of the country, while they and their corporate PAC contributors know the member help to weaken the bill in private. A glaring example of this deceptive practice is the Clear Skies Act of 2003, a bill that became law under a deceptively environmentally friendly name that was actually written by industrial polluters. To quote scripture, this is how 
the little foxes spoil the vines. That is to say, this is how special interests spoil democratic government. And it is a system that operates not only on the national level, but also in all 50 states. This political system has led to the top 1% controlling over 40% of the investment assets, the top 5% controlling close to 70%, the top 10% controlling over 80%, and the top 20% controlling over 92% of the investment assets in America. This means 80% of Americans share only the remaining 7 or 8%. It is exceedingly naive for any of us to believe that the very rich, after having created, supported, and benefited from such an undemocratic and inequitable political system, would risk or subject the wealth they made from that political system to democratic procedure, or that the politicians, the very rich finance, will represent typical Americans. The belief that in a representative democracy, typical Americans have a choice is a gross illusion that must be dispelled before any substantial change can accrue to the benefit of typical Americans and for the common good. The real owners, the big wealthy business interests that control things and make all the important decisions. Forget the politicians. They're, they're, they're irrelevant. The, the politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't. You have no choice. You have owners. They own you. They own everything. They own all the important land. They own and control the corporations. They've long since bought and paid for the Senate, the Congress, the state houses, the city halls. They've got the judges in their back pockets. And they own all the big media, media new, all the big media companies, so they control just about all of the news and information you get to hear. They, they spend billions of dollars every year lobbying, <laughs> lobbying to get what they want. Well, we know what they want. They want more for themselves and less for everybody else. They own this place. It's a big club, and you ain't in it. You and I are not in the big club. The table is tilted, folks. The game is rigged. Good, honest, hard-working people, white collar, blue collar, doesn't matter what color shirt you have on. Good, honest, hard-working people continue. These are people of modest means. Continue to elect these rich. They don't care about you at all, at all, at all. Yeah. Since representative democracies have been shown in practice to be effectively ruled by a minority of wealth, the formal representational process is largely a fiction if it is thought to be anything more than a method of relieving public tension and reevaluating mass public support. Unlike an attorney representing a client in court or an investment fund representative holding a seat on a company board, a congressional representative cannot represent the diversity of 500,000 people, the average population in a congressional district, Moreover, it cannot rightly be claimed in our winner-take-all system that those who voted for losing candidates have any representation. It is truly a quin-essentially rotten system. Laws that should be a few pages and reasonably understandable to typical Americans end up being hundreds of pages filled with special interest exemptions that effectively gut the spirit of the legislation. As Thomas Ferguson has written, it is high time both social scientists and voters learned to read the handwriting on the wall. To discover who rules, follow the gold, that is, trace the origins and financing of the campaign.